the time has come to look at one of the most beloved pieces by Franz Liszt. Number three of his Liebestraume, Dreams of Love. Originally, Liz wrote this music as three songs and then transcribed them for piano, which is something he did very often with a lot of works for other composers as well. And it's quite telling that they were songs because the melody stays so much on one note and normally it doesn't work well in an instrumental setting because the voice has so much more possibilities of expression with different vowels than any instrument has. But this is kind of an exception because it's so many colorful harmony changes. And the three pieces are based on three different poems about love with different facets of love between them. The final in the set is about the ultimate love that exceeds all in a way. So the poem is by Ferdinand Freiligrath, came out in 1829, Liszt wrote this in 1850. O lieb, du lang du lieben kannst, O love as long as love you can, O love as long as love you may, the time will come, the time will come, where you will stand at the grave and mourn. So it's actually a lot of talk about when the loved one is dead, and there's mourning at the grave and regret about some vague, hurtful, words or actions. So there is a strong inner conflict that shows in the music in the turmoil of the middle section and the tension towards the end. But in the end, it's a celebration of love as a strong force in the world. So let's start with the form of the piece. It's clearly in three sections with two cadenzas separating them. And the first and the third section has the love theme when it's soft and tender. And the middle section also has the love theme but it's transformed in character and it's modulating a lot and we get these big pianistic textures it's culminating in the second cadenza and then when we return with the third section and the love theme in a flat major again and soft it's a reassurance of the tender love so here we have the melody So it's actually a circular fifth progression underneath in all major dominant chords, sevenths, but a little bit altered. So after A flat major, goes jumps to C7 with the G in the bass. This is just for the chromatic bass line. And then C7 to F7 to B flat with the add 9 and then to E flat 7 to A flat. So C, F, B, B flat, E flat, A flat, circular fifth, but a little bit of extra coloring notes. So it's one round, then we go for the second round, starts the same. Extra chromaticism in the bass. the melody goes up instead of down but then it's the same ending and this is the equivalent of rhyming in music so like the original poem in German it's rhyming it's not in the English translation but here it's rhyming in the music the two phrases end in the same way although it is longer time spans in music Anyway, we get the continuation of the melody with uh, the ever so lovely. This is a minor four chord, D flat minor to A flat major. Um, all the way 
plays a lovely chord. Continuing upward. And now going to C major. This is outside of A flat major tonality. So already we're starting to fly around harmonically and exploring new fields. He uses this one note as a pivoting note. Well, actually not. It's the first bars is the same, but here we're in C. So you have the E and change chord underneath to E major. So we cannot get stuck on this motif. Here you have to play the melody in between the hands. Well, all the time actually. Uh, it's because it's a transcription. So it's an E flat and uh, the D flat minor. It's kind of a modal cadence. And now when we get the first cadenza, it's still E flat, seven. It's only this chord. It's a prolonged inflated presentation of this oscillation with these two chords. And it's just list expands it over the registers. And gives it so much life, only those two chords. But it's very firmly an E flat to land. So this could be the dominant back to a flat major but now when we go to the uh, second section we immediately kicks off in a new key so it's the same theme but it's now in B major so E flat you can say that the E flat is a pivoting note. Um, we have a. It's a surprising effect uh, from E flat to B major. So it's a new higher register and new textures, but it's the same material. So the second time. This is something new. This is an amazing mechanism. So instead of going the first time, going to G sharp 7 to C sharp and continuing the circular fifth, now we get instead of G sharp 7, this is a G sharp 7 but it's spelled like an A flat plus 6, so it's the augmented 6 chord, uh, reinterpreting this chord. To uh, augment the sixth chord in the progression of a uh, cadence in C major to the G sixth chord and G dominant kind of extensions. And that's the resolution to C major. And this D sharp, it's really aching a, a sharp dissonance to this. But it's one of the things that makes the piece so great to have it. And it's also a difference between Liszt and Chopin. Like Chopin would never write this type of dissonance. Uh, Chopin is more careful with the details and kind of the counterpoint. But in Liszt, the details are less important than the general thrust of the music. So, and I'm not saying that any of these positions are better or worse. It's just a different approach to the music. And when we're playing Liszt, we can enjoy this. <laughs> Now we get the same continuation with a minor 4 chord. Now we're in C major, so it's going to be F minor. So, sempre stringendo, always pushing and uh, accelerating. This is the accelerating prospects of love. But after the continuation, this is the theme again. And this time it's kind of interrupting. 
compared to the first section, the continuation gets stuck on this, what will become the first cadenza. Now we get a new entry of the theme and in E major, so all the time <laughs> pushing the modulation as well. And now the textures are starting to get hard here. You have to jump with both hands. But it's, it's kind of the same chord, so it's, it could be harder, but uh, like it's symmetrical at least. It's the same theme. for the second time. So it's again using this note as a pivoting note, changing the harmony, and this is lovely progression. And we finally, like, the left hand is chromatically going down. We land on this B flat dominant uh, here. So now we're kind of approaching the second cadenza and harmonically this is pointing back to A flat major. This is actually some new material. We haven't have had it before, but it's uh, just have to use this energy. Appassionato, assai, very passionate, and then affrettando is uh, quickening and hurrying. So really can't contain it much longer. Oh yeah, and E flat 11, very jazzy. And like these extensions, nine and 11 on the dominant chord, I get the feeling that they have this bubbly quality, like, yeah, it can be contained. And here, all this built-up energy needs to emancipate in this uh, chromatic cadenza. This is like butterflies in the stomach about love. And going up again, it's outlining an E-flat 9 chord. This really tender reaching and this is a really good example of the music philosopher Meyer and the kind of early theories about uh, phenomenology in music uh, how the music sets up expectations and when they are fulfilled you are satisfied so when we get this motion you can guess what next note is coming it's the C and it's very satisfying when it comes. So this is the theme again, but now it's in the high register. In the beginning it's down here. And we have this added twinkling stars and central hand crossings. really nice. If you have survived the second cadenza, you can really enjoy playing this. But here's something new is happening. Uh, now the left hand starts going down chromatically. It's going to keep going. And I think this is, is a bittersweetness to this music here. And I think it's from the poem. In the first verse, uh, the time will come when you will stand at the grave and mourn. And it's all this talk about mourning. With great love comes great sorrow. I think that's what we, uh, he's alluding to here. Uh, there are some tension and pain left still. because it's going to go down chromatically. And slowing down. A 
until here. Finally a cadence to A flat major. It's the flat nine. And here I think you need some more energy uh, because it's it's not over yet. Still some some uh, bars left. We get this kind of code of choral chords. It's uncertain. It's a question mark. Try again. Still a question. And maybe we get some kind of answer here. Yes, we're back to tonic A flat major. A first inversion, it's a tritone relationship to E flat, that's a dominant. And uh, suspensions, resolving one at a time. Now the final, it never ends these chords. It's kind of a major seven, A flat major seven, and it's the plagal chord cadence, D flat within this chord. Thanks for watching Sonata Secrets. The Patreon shoutout in this episode goes to G. Katkov and K. Narayanan.